Sharon Osbourne said she had her vagina tightened. But Ozzy doesn't look any different to me. Oh, hell yeah, it's time for another Vieira Vault. And boy, I got the inspiration to do this now while I was driving around in my car with my iPod shuffle cranking the tunes and disturbing the priest came on. And I turned that fucker up all the way and I'm driving around listening to this song. And it was just, man, I was just thinking, this is fucking glorious music, man. And then it dawned on me, I said, you know, a lot of people don't like the sound of this album. And I'm here listening to it going, this sounds amazing to me. It sounds awesome. Oh, oh, muddy or whatever you want to call it. It adds to the charm, man. It makes it even heavier for me. So everybody out there that um, has a problem with the production, but you like the songs. (laughs) You don't enjoy it as much as I do. I'm sorry, but that's the truth, man. Actually, I'm not sorry. You cannot enjoy Born Again to the full velocity, the full greatness in every aspect as I do. Do I mean to rub it in? You bet your fucking ass I do. This album rules, man. I'll never forget when I first got it. I was floored. I was like, my God, this is so heavy. This is like the heaviest Black Sabbath album ever, and I still think that. I mean, Sabotage, the song Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, Under the Sun, you know, they're all heavy songs, but this one, man, is heavier than everything. And look, I am a Black Sabbath purist. Me, when it comes to Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath is Ozzy Osbourne, Tony Iommi, Bill Ward, and Geezer Butler. Every lineup after that, rules, I have no problem with it, except for 13, that sucked, but it's not Black Sabbath to me, it totally changed its sound, you know, it doesn't sound like Black Sabbath to me, Black Sabbath is that doom, experimental type of music, you know, I mean, I can't think of any lineup after the original four that would play a song like, I don't know, Cornucopia, And then, you know, flip the coin around and there's Air Dance. And it was all, and it all still sounded like Black Sabbath, you know, but Black Sabbath. Heaven and Hell, perfection. Mob Rules, perfection. This album, perfection. I love Seven Star. I love the Tony Martin years. But it's not Black Sabbath to me. This album I'm about to talk about is not Black Sabbath to me, but it's an awesome fucking album. So I'm going to dedicate this show to it because I love it so much. And to give you a little backstory on this, Ian Gillen is the singer on this album from Deep Purple. And if you look at the album cover with the baby, the background is purple. Get it? Like Deep Purple? Uh, you know what? It took me a while to realize that till somebody pointed that out to me. Years, actually. And I was like, wow, that's true. It's a deep purple background. And uh, how he f- joined the band. He got drunk with Tony and Geezer one night at a bar. And, I mean, really drunk, like shit-faced. And then the next day he woke up and he got a call from his manager saying, you joined Black Sabbath? And he was like, what? I did? So he basically joined the band in, uh, while he was like sloshed. But he went through with it. And uh, I'm getting this information from the book Doom Let Loose. And Bill Ward came back. And Bill Ward at the time was sober. And he loved his drumming on this album. And so do I. I think this is more Bill Ward style than Heaven and Hell. Heaven and Hell, he was more in the pocket. You know, where classic, you know, 70s Sabbath. He was, he had that swing. You know, he had the Gornick. Uh, organic playing but you know he just played it safe on heaven and hell and it worked and I remember reading an interview with Ozzy 
a couple years after that album came out in the 80s, him saying that the only album he liked from Black Sabbath without him was Born Again. Maybe uh, it's a bullshit article, but I did read it. You know, I don't know if Ozzy said it or not, but if he did, that's cool as hell. You know? But um, anyway, the band hated the mix. The band hated the production. Uh, Ian Gillen and Bill Ward both said they hated the album cover. I love it all. I embrace it all. I know some people will say, well, you like it, but Ian Gillen doesn't. Who cares? Ian Gillen, I've heard, likes to dress in women's clothes. Would you dress in women's clothes? If you don't, then shut the fuck up. I love the production of this album. I love the album cover. I love the tour, yes. I got to see the tour and Night Ranger of all bands opened. But Night Ranger, was, I liked Night Ranger back then. They were on their second album. Sister Christian wasn't a hit yet, so they didn't play it that night. But that night was magical. And I'll go into that show before I go into the album. And I know my last episode I said I didn't want to be the rock, the rock and Metal Combat Podcast to review albums. Well, I'm going to stick with that. I'm not going to review this album. I'm going to worship this fucking album. That's what this... This, this podcast is not a, an album review. It's an album worship episode. Because I love it so much. Band should be called Born Again, though, not Black Sabbath. But that's besides the point. Let's keep going. Man... Sunrise Musical Theater. Hall's about 5,000 people. Uh, smaller place. They couldn't fit Stonehenge in there. If you guys know the story, they built a Stonehenge. And most markets, they couldn't fit it in the arena. So there were a lot of shows they played where they didn't have the Stonehenge on stage. Though there were some that they did have it on stage because I've seen pictures. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, I remember like... The story was they had a little a little guy dressed in a dressed in a devil outfit walk across Stonehenge, and uh, they had uh, bed uh, beds on the bottom, so he fell off the Stonehenge onto the beds, and one night he missed the beds, and he hit the floor and he started screaming. So I think they cut that out. I know they didn't do it at the show I was, but that's a little backstory of the tour. But man, to me they came out all dry ice on stage and they come out and they play my all-time favorite real Black Sabbath song, Children of the Grave. Uh, By this time, Ian knew the words because I remember he was great that night. He didn't fuck up anything because I know during early parts of that tour, he had the lyrics on the floor and the dry ice would cover it and he wouldn't know what the fuck to sing. But that night, he knew it. He knew every song. They played War Pigs. I'll never forget the vision. I was pretty close to the stage, too. I'd say it was like maybe fifth row on Tony Iommi's side. And I'll never forget War Pigs. Like, he had bongos on stage. And Ian Gillen was like, he had that super long hair. And he, I, I, I never forget that vision of that just mop of hair, like going back and forth while he's playing the bongos. The real rare songs they played that night was Super Nault, which I was like, holy fuck. And Rock and Roll Doctor, which I'm not really a fan of that song, but I'll take it. It's the only time I ever saw Geezer and Tony play those songs, you know. And Bev Bavane was the drummer at the time. Bill Ward was, I didn't think Bill Ward did any shows on this tour. He played on the album. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think he fell off the wagon after recording the album. Maybe he fell off the wagon when he saw the album cover and heard the mix, (laughs) you know. But I I remember reading Bill Ward saying he loved that album and the drumming. So I'm not sure if he had a problem with the mix. I know for sure uh, Ian did. And I I believe uh, Geezer complained about it again uh, as well. Um, Tony, I don't think he did. I could be wrong. I don't know. I haven't read that book in a while. I'm just going by memory. But yeah, and that night they played Disturbing the Priest, my favorite song off the album. They didn't play Trashed, which was the first single, but they did play Hotline. Um, They didn't play Digital Bitch, did they? I don't think they did. But they played Zero the Hero. They played the title track. And I think that's it. And the rest was just the classics. And I know Heaven and Hell was played that night. A few Dio songs, a few Ozzy songs. It was awesome. And it was loud. 
I mean, every time I've seen Black Sabbath, they were extremely loud. The loudest bands I've ever seen in my life is Black Sabbath and Motorhead. And there was a show I saw where Black Sabbath played with Motor Motorhead and Morbid Angel, Cross Purposes Tour, and I told everybody, hey, man, you better take earplugs to that shit because, you know, Motorhead and Black Sabbath are the loudest bands ever. But anyway, it was a stellar show. I still got the tour book. Uh, I did buy a jersey that night. Uh, it had the baby on the front and the back. It had like a script with a, like an evil hand writing on it with a feather, you know, old school feather and ink thing. Uh, lyrics, I think born again. I can't quite remember, but, uh, you buy shirts in the eighties. I mean, when I bought shirts in the eighties, I had a washer machine that hated concert shirts and it would destroy them. So of course I don't have it anymore. That's why tour books are forever, man. I always make a point of buying tour. I'd rather buy a tour book than a shirt, even though shirts now last a long ass time. Cause I have shirts that are over 20 years old. They're still good in good shape. But anyway, yes, I was honored enough to see the born again tour still got that book. And I believe the album Gillen in, I think that's the name of the album. Uh, Tony Iommi and, and Ian Gillen re-recorded trash on that album. Trash is such an awesome song. And I was, if there was anything that disappointed me about that show, was Trash wasn't played. And I found out later, I believe it was in the Doom Let Loose book, they never played it. They never played Trash, which is so weird. So odd. But Trash is awesome. It's an amazing opening track. I absolutely love this song. Ian Gillen wrote it. Uh, the lyrics about, you know, he had a, a go-kart, like, I think it belonged to Bill Ward, and he crashed it, and that was the story behind it, and when they were recording the album, Ian Gillen had a tent, he slept in a tent outside, because he's wacky, and he had two tents, one tent for his golf clubs, and one tent for him, and he also had a boat there, and what the members of Black Sabbath did, I'm not quite sure which member it was, Probably Tony Iommi because he loved doing pranks. Uh, they ended up uh, blowing up his tents and sinking his boat. Wacky guys. Anyway, I absolutely love this song. I love the lyrics. Uh, it really was a meeting. The bottle took a beating. You know, there was no tequila. I love it. And the video, oh my God, the video. I think this is the first time uh, there's been like a video made that was like part one and then they made a video for Zero the Hero that's part two and part one of the video is a guy pretty much running away from some people trying to kidnap him runs into a, a church and there's an uncensored version of it I don't know if it's up on YouTube where Hitler does a brief appearance in Trashed where he, he appears a lot on the next video. But, uh, yeah, and there's a lot of um, scenes of car racings and car crashes and, and like, scantily clad women running around and this dude running away from these people, runs into a church, kneels in front of a big statue, and then the statue turns around. It's one of the crazy-looking demonic people with stitches all over their face trying to get him. And the video ends with them getting him and throwing him in a van. And uh, that goes into uh, then in the next video of Zero the Hero, which I'll go into Zero the Hero now. See, I'm not doing an album review. I'm not going in order here. Zero the Hero is what ends side one. And that video, it shows what happens to the guy. They kidnap him. They, I don't know what, they zombify him. I don't know. And, and then you see Hitler a lot in that and a horse trying to climb stairs. And it's a wacky ass video. I love those early MTV videos. You know, a lot of people look at them as cheesy. I mean, the makeup is terrible in this video, but it's awesome. And they make the guy down a bottle. Uh, well, he, they don't make him. He gladly downs a bottle of ketchup. <laughs> it's just a fucked up video. Like, and actually the video has the dark. See, um, the dark is a little tiny interlude to Zero the Hero. Where the video features the dark and Zero the Hero, which is super cool. And they have, you know, the guy that captured, they had him wrapped in cellophane in the beginning of the video. I guess they suffocated him and gave him a lobotomy. And Hitler, like, puts a, 
you know, kind of like knights him and kisses him on both cheeks and puts something around his neck. My God, it's so fucking weird. I love it. Awesome song too, Zero the Hero, which a lot of people say that uh, Guns N' Roses borrowed that riff, sped it up for Paradise City. Also Danzig, Her Black Wings. They both sound very, very similar. What a great way to end side one with the dark and Zero the Hero with the bizarre lyrics. You know, they sit by the river eating raw liver. <laughs> Love it. And God, what a highlight that was when I saw them play it live. But before I go into the side two, I am missing a song. Actually, two songs. Uh, which is my favorite track off the album, Disturbing the Priest and Stonehenge. Stonehenge is the beginning of it. Of um, I Like the Dark, it's an interlude. And you know, if there's a deluxe edition out there that brings like a longer version of the dark. It's an extended version. Which is really cool. I wouldn't have minded that extended version on it. And it kind of like, you know, that, what was that? E5150 off Mob Rules kind of has that same vibe. These interludes, some weird dark bass noises and stuff. And, uh, but zero they, I mean, uh, disturbing the priest. My God, what a song, man. Um, which Ian Gillen got the, uh, inspirational lyrics cause, uh, where they were rehearsing, it was very close to a church and a priest, was trying to, I think it was a choir practice or something he was trying to have, but Black Sabbath kept dur- uh, drowning him out, like I was saying earlier. Black Sabbath is loud. And the priest went by there going, hey, man, I'm trying to, like, you know, teach the kids how to sing here. Can you guys t- turn it down a bit? Then Ian Gillen said, hey, man, when do you guys rehearse? We'll, we'll just not practice during that time. And then later on, Ian ended up going to the bar and drinking with the priest, getting drunk with him. But man, this song, those screams, you know, I saw, I'll never forget how I found out Ian Gillen left Black Sabbath. I was actually at a Specs Records. I remember this vividly. I was at a Specs record sifting through vinyl with a friend and a friend showed up and he goes, hey man, Ian Gillen left Black Sabbath. And I remember I just stopped flipping through the vinyl and sat there and looked at him and went, what? What? And I was so pissed. I was like, no, man, come on. Dio lasted two albums. And this guy only lasted one. And Born Again is so cool. Fuck, don't tell me they're not going to do another album with Ian Gillen. But as we all know, Ian Gillen left to rejoin Deep Purple, which was, I saw that tour. It was the only time I ever saw Deep Purple with Blackmore. And Ian Gillen was still amazing. He did child in time that night and you know that's not easy to sing but i will tell you this you could hear the cracks already on the perfect strangers tour of his voice where man his peak was definitely born again i am so honored i got to see ian gillen at his peak because those screams he was doing that night like on this song disturbing the priest were spot on man. and i gotta say man I said it before and i'll say it again it is the greatest screams I ever heard on any song. The sickest screams, especially those final screams in that final. Um, God, it's so cool. Check it out. This, I love it. I love this part. How it ends. Oh my God, that rules! Jesus, that rules! God, I can't get enough of that song. When I heard that in my car blasting today, I was like, I want to do a podcast talking about this album. I did do a review on my original YouTube channel, Eternal Idols, and it's still up. But back then, I mean, this was like oof, back like 10 years ago, where YouTube l- would limit videos to 15 minutes. So I'd have to like compress all that you know, all what I thought of the album and the backstory, all in 15 minutes where actually I watched it now before I started this, you know, to remember some of the notes that I'm telling you guys about. And God, I, I, I just breathed too quick through the song. So thank God for the Vieira of all podcasts. Whoa, and YouTube now I can do a real long version, but shit, I'm doing it right here. And uh, all the backstories and the doom let loose. That's where I got all my information from Martin Popoff 
who's uh writes incredible books. I mean, him and I don't see eye to eye in a lot of things, you know, like he thought the lyrics to trash were stupid. I think they're fucking brilliant. But uh and also I did that review on YouTube with a co host, Jack Daniels, yes. A bottle of Jack Daniels. Back when I used to drink, I was pretty slotch, hairs all over my face. Give it a look if you need a good laugh. Back then I would end all my Black Sabbath episodes with uh you know, your Black Sabbath fucked your mom and I'd always have a different way of saying it every time. And even on one of the episodes I actually had a <laughs> a girl actually giving me head saying, Hey look, it's your mom. You know, her back was to the camera, so but she was actually sucking my dick. True story. Eternal Idol channel. It's still there. Uh but my main channel is almost human fifty six. So join that. I'm putting all the Black Sabbath reviews over there. Anyway, on side two, it starts with Digital Bitch. Man, you know, I've met a lot of people throughout uh, throughout my life that hate this song. I don't get it. This song rocks. It's so awesome. Ian Gillen said it was about a story he wrote about some rich girl. And there was a rumor back then that it was this song was really about Sharon Osbourne. Because at the time, Don Arden was their manager, and Don Arden was Sharon's dad. And they were not speaking to each other because of like, the whole Ozzy thing. And you know, he, had, he managed Ozzy, then she managed Ozzy, and then they got in a big fight with Jet Records involved, and they didn't speak for many, many years. And Don Arden was also the guy that came up with the concept of the baby on the album cover. And he was kind of like a mafioso, man. You didn't fuck with Don Arden. He was known to like hang people, you know, over like balconies on the 20th floor somewhere. Kind of like a Peter Grant type manager. But if you ask me, I have a feeling this is about Sharon Osbourne and they just don't want to admit it. Ian Gillen said it was about something else, but I think they're just trying to like, you know, since Sharon Osbourne is so popular in the management business and she can pull strings and stuff that they were like, no, no, it's not about you. But I believe it was back then. But anyway, God, I love this song. I think it's heavy, great blistering t- tune. Love Again, I mean, how can I not say I love the riff? It's fucking Tony Iommi writing these riffs. So of course they're great. Great solo. You know, it's a fast tempo song like Trashed. It just rules. And I remember back in the day, uh, there was um, a Saturday night concert. It was like, like all heavy metal. And let me see if I remember correctly. It was Rat, ACDC, uh, Dio, Holy Diver era, and Black Sabbath. And Black Sabbath did Digital Bitch and Zero the Hero. But they lip synced it. Where every other show, every other band was actually live. Well, perform live. Because that Rat show, you can tell there's nobody in the audience. But they were performing live like in a sound uh, sound check situation. And I remember back in the day, man, cable, you know, I had the MTV. I had a bunch of my friends in my house. Like my good friend Eve, who I just spoke to yesterday, we're still great friends. We all got really drunk. I used to check out my living situation back then. I, I was like, let me see, this was 83. I was 18, 17, 18. And I had a little house in back of my parents' house. Like, I lived separate from them. There was an outside, there was a a bathroom in the carport that I would use. So there wasn't, so it was like a little tiny room and I would sneak all my friends back there and we'd smoke pot, do drugs and drink alcohol while my parents were fast asleep late at night. Anyway, so uh, we all, Everybody came to my house because I was the only guy that had MTV back then out of all my friends. All my friends lived on Miami Beach. This was in Hialeah, which is about a 20, 30 minute drive. So that we all came to Hialeah, went to a Mylander Park, got fucked up, waited for my parents to go to sleep. I'm always the guy that goes inside the house first. And there was an alleyway behind my little house that I would make them all come, come through there, not the front of the house. Because my parents' room was in the front of the house. So they'd all sneak in. So we all would get drunk and watch this shit. And cable TV back then, like the local cable company, 
they would show their own commercials when MTV would show commercials. And man, it just so happens the commercials ran way too long. And when it came back, and I used to have a VCR back then, I was recording, but I wasn't recording commercials. And <clears throat> when the commercial ended, it was right in the middle of Digital Bitch. I was like, son of a bitch. And then I pressed record, and I only got like toward the end of it. But the glory of YouTube, now you can see the full performance, the full lip sync performance of Digital Bitch and uh, Zero the Hero. That's the only two songs they played, where all the other bands was like 20, 30 minutes each. I remember the ACDC was a flick of the switch tour, which was the next day. And that was like a good hour long episode, uh, concert, but at Joe Louis arena, which has been released on, I believe the backtracks box set, which I own anyway. So yeah, uh, digital bitch, man. <clears throat> uh, and then the title track on here is born again. And whole oh, man, this is where they finally like, they tone it down a little bit. You know, it's kind of mellow and shit and the way Ian sings. But man, that chorus is so fucking balls out heavy. And those notes Ian hits. Oh, my Lord. never gets old. It never gets old. My God. I know I get very passionate about this, but you know what? I love that I get passionate about this. You know? Better than getting passionate about some guy feeling somebody's nuts saying, hut, two, three, four. Fuck sports. This is sports. Here, listen to fucking Ian Gillen hit those notes. God damn, that's fucking Super Bowl material. That Super Bowl and the World Series and Stanley Cup rolled into one. My God, is that amazing. And you know, I do remember a backlash of this album back then. People were like, what the fuck is this garbage? Because people weren't ready. You know? <clears throat> you know, you did have your melodies with, you know, with Dio, with uh, Children of the Grave, I mean, Children of the Sea, and, you know, uh, Sign of the Southern Cross, you know, beautiful little, which is great. I love it. You know, Country Girl is borderline commercial-ish. This is no barred, pure brutality metal. I have also seen a lot of interviews from different death metal bands that cite Born Again as a huge influence. So in a way, you know, because it's such a dirty, muddy, ugh, heavy album that you know, Cannibal Corpse did a cover of Zero the Hero. And I, I know, I know a lot of death metal bands love Born Again. I've seen, I remember seeing Nile where the singer was wearing a Born Again shirt. It was, was it the bass player? I can't remember. But, you know, I've seen Born Again shirts uh, worn by death metal bands, not just Nile. Uh, you know, it's amazing how influential Tony Iommi is because you can't say Black Sabbath when you say Born Again. I mean, even though it is, three out of the four original members. And and man, the drumming, you know, it's different than the Bill Ward swing. It's like, but it's still kind of unorthodox, like the 70s. It's not in the pocket like Heaven and Hell. Uh, he does some inventive shit. And I, Bill Ward said he's very proud of the drumming on this album, as he should be. But anyway, that is Born Again. And then uh, goes into Hotline. And if memory serves me correct, this is the second tune they played live. Right after Children of the Grave, they went into Hotline. Another blistering, awesome song. Take me to the river, take my wine. Oh, man. Gillen's on fire. The whole band is on fire. And that the Hotline's one of the fan favorites. I know a lot of people point to that one, and I don't blame them because it's a smoking great and... If any song has hooks on this album, it would be, it would be that. Man, I guess Digital Bitch to an extent, but not as much as Hotline. Hotline is kind of catchy. It is kind of a catchy tune. It's coming toward the end of the album. And it's, it's God, it rules. And I have something special uh, with uh, this song, Hotline, in the Vieira Vault. But we got to go into the Vieira Vault for me to tell you about it. And you may want to stick around, especially 
if you're a fan of this song, you're going to want to hear this. But, <clears throat> man, Hotline, amazing song. Amazing. And yeah, let me pick up, I have the deluxe version here in front of me. <clears throat> and it is, um, I'll tell you what's on here. And I highly recommend this. Don't expect it to be remastered or, you know, because I remember when this came out, a lot of people were complaining, going, they didn't fix the sound, man. And I was like, good, good. Don't fix it. Leave it as is. <clears throat> so, what this album brings, it's the album, it's two discs, and the bonus track is The Fallen, which I'll talk about a bit, and uh, Stonehenge, the extended version, which I was telling you, plus, uh, I believe it's, where's my glasses, live at the Reading Festival, if I'm wrong, then check it out, but I can see, I can make out the the songs played, because, you know, uh, the Texas are in yellow, where that, yeah, it is Reading Festival, I think, yeah, because it's in dark red, so I can hardly make it out. But the songs are Hotline, War Pigs, Black Sabbath, The Dark, uh, Zero the Hero, Digital Bitch, Iron Man, Smoke on the Water, and Paranoid. And yes, I remember them playing Smoke on the Water the night I saw the Born Again Tour. Which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the only time Tony Omi ever played a song that wasn't his during a Black Sabbath show? I mean, Black Sabbath tour? I think it is. Because they weren't known to do covers. I mean, was Evil Woman ever performed live in the early days? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, is that that's the only cover? Oh no, The Warning. The Warning's also a cover. Uh, which I wanna, I'm going to touch upon the first Black Sabbath album. I want to throw that in here as well. As a little bonus thing. But anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, Hotline, it rules, all right? What else can I say about it? Then it ends with uh, Keep It Warm. Now, Keep It Warm. Man, even up to... I remember that song I didn't like. Like, after Hotline, I would, I would take the needle off the record. Because I was never in, into keep, keep, uh, keep It Warm. But, man, was I stupid back then. Because Keep It Warm's amazing. It's an amazing track, which just shows there's not a filler track on this album. I don't care what you say, you digital bitch. Bitches. That bitch about that song. <clears throat> I think that's an outstanding song. And Keep It Warm is outstanding. It's a great song. It's a little more laid back, but still heavy with that, ooh, nasty, snarly riff that starts that song. And, you know, Ian Gillen's sleazy lyrics. I just love it. And I love the way it ends. It's kind of like, you know, again, a little bit commercial-ish. But nobody that's into commercial music would like that. Because it's too heavy and too... It's for real men. Okay? Not for you commercial pansies out there. Keep it warm. Rules! I absolutely love that song and I totally take back what I said and I wish I can go back in time where I didn't lift up that needle. Wish somebody would have stopped me saying, no, you fucking listen. Because in the future, you're going to end up loving this song. So stop being a poser. So yeah, keep it warm. Rules. All right, and then the track that didn't make the album. Now, The Fallen is a song I did not hear till, hmm, I'd say it was in the 2000s, maybe early 2000s. My friend Holy George uh, got a, a copy of, uh, you know, rough the rough mixes of the song that brought the the Fallen. So, and which, by the way, it doesn't come in the deluxe edition. All the other raw takes of the songs, does it? I don't believe it does. No, no, it doesn't. And um, but I have I have it. I have all the rough versions, which is great too. I mean, I don't, I don't see really much of a difference as polish, but you can tell there is a difference, but not much. But the fallen, I, I believe the fallen wasn't touched up at all on here, <clears throat> just like uh, the Eternal Idols Deluxe Edition, which I have. I used to have before that Deluxe Edition the Ray Gillen demos, so that when I got the Deluxe Edition of Eternal Idols, I thought, oh, the, now we're going to get some, you know, polished up demos of Ray Gillen. No, they didn't fix it at all. So I, I feel the same thing with The Fallen. The Fallen's not like newly mixed or anything. It sounds just like 
you know, how those other songs sounded. So if you guys are aware of the song, The Fallen, uh, the, the rest of the album sounds just like that. Same kind of production. But m- boy, The Fallen, huh? Wow, what a blistering song. Should have made the album. And I think it would have been a great closer. Not Keep It Warm. And believe me, there's nothing wrong with Keep It Warm ending the album. But I think The Fallen would have been a better choice to end it. And uh, it's a blistering song. And I love, you know, there, the intro, that sounds like a Bill Ward type early riffage, organic little intro by Bill. And then Iomi does this riff. I've never heard Iomi do before. It's totally different than Iomi's style. Then it goes into this... It's kind of different. But you can still tell it's Iomi, but it's, it's him trying to do something different, which is great. And it's heavy. It's fast. An amazing song that fits the album perfectly. So I don't know why the hell they left it off. If any complaint I have of the early days of this album was not being aware of The Fallen until like 20 somewhat years later. The Fallen rules, and it does finally appear on the deluxe edition here that I'm looking at right now. I love this CD. Love it. I love the deluxe edition. I mean, I have... I bought Born Again on CD, but it's the Vertigo version, which Vertigo was infamous of, you know, you put on CD, the volume wasn't really that loud. They boosted up the volume on this. They didn't fix the sound or remix it or anything, but at least they boost the sound of the CD. So I highly recommend, if it's still out there, it should be, the deluxe edition of Born Again. Look into it. Because if you're listening to me now, you must be interested in the album. And if you don't have the deluxe edition, you need to hear The Fallen. Anyway, that's the end of uh, the Born Again, but as promised, I want to talk briefly about the first Black Sabbath album because... As I am recording this right now, it just struck 12 a.m. And it is February 13th, 2020, which means 50 years ago from today, the first Black Sabbath album was released on February 13th, 1970. So not only happy birthday to Black Sabbath, the first album, but happy birthday to heavy metal. Fuck Blue Cheer. If you think Blue Cheer invented metal, then what the hell are you, racist? Because what what was Jimi Hendrix doing any different? Okay? You know, you can talk about proto-metal and stuff, but the first real metal album was the first Black Sabbath album. If you disagree, that's fine. That's cool. But don't you come preach to me because I am dead set in my way. Today is the, uh, the happy birthday to the first Black Sabbath album. And I've lived with it for, ooh, decades. Not 50 years, but, yeah, around 40. Yeah, it's been like 40 years or so. And boy, I've gone through a lot of changes on that album, and now my favorite track on that album is the cover. That ends the album, Warning, that long-ass song. Love it. But I love the whole album. The first song, uh, Behind the Wall of Sleep, NIB, Wicked World, or Evil Woman, and diff- you know which country you're in. Uh, Sleeping Village, uh, God, it's just so much. Bit of Finger, uh, basically. I think I know. It doesn't matter if I named all the songs. Go buy that if you haven't. God, I love that album. And I love Black Sabbath, my all-time favorite band. That, to me, is more Black Sabbath than Born Again. Okay? It's not slamming Born Again. I'm just saying. Black Sabbath, to me, is Ozzy, Bill, Geezer, and Tony. Period. But that's it. That's all. You know, I just want to say happy birthday to metal. And if you're listening to this while it's brand new on the 13th, tonight at 8 p.m. Central on thatmetalstation.com, I will be doing my happy birthday to metal show. Anyway, that's it. So now I'm going to show you something really cool, you guys that like Hotline. So let's go into the vault. All right, so we're in the vault, and I got to show you guys something that I think you're going to really dig if you like the song Hotline. My, the amazing Alex Marquez, my favorite drummer, is also an amazing singer. And he had a band called Apocalypse Rising, and they did a cover of Hotline. And it shows you, man, this guy... 
to sing this song, you know you got to be damn impressive. And goddamn, is he impressive on here. Check it out. This is Alex Marquez on vocals, also known for his drumming and malevolent creation, demolition hammer, anger, and so on. And thrash or die, of course, on Melting Your Skull. Check it out. Apocalypse Rising with Hot Live. <laughs>
fucking A, man. God damn. Now he's the greatest drummer, but one of the greatest fucking singers, too. What a freak of nature that Alex Marquez is. Great guy. And uh, we may be doing something on YouTube on my Almost Human channel in the future. He lives in Phoenix now, but he's coming down, I think, next month. And uh, we spoke about talking about Born Again, and we'll probably do a video about it and put it on the Almost Human channel. And in case you're not on the Almost Human channel, please subscribe and ring that little bell for notifications. Come to the end of the show if you're still listening. I'm sure you're catching your breath after that amazing performance from Mr. Marquez. And I want to thank you so much for listening. You know, I appreciate each and every one of you. Please uh, subscribe uh, to the Spreaker channel and uh, iTunes. Leave a iTunes review, which uh, reminds me, I did get an iTunes review that I should read now. Uh, I still have it open. It's uh, a guy called Weird Guy 2020. Uh, he said, Dr. Fuck is metal royalty. And he wrote, thank you for the Frank Marino. Wow, great podcast. Uh, I'm not sure which podcast that was. It probably was the one before those Cheap Trick podcasts because I haven't really been on iTunes in a while. I have put up some Vieira Vols, and I promise you, this time I really mean it. Well, you know, <clears throat> I did. I said this before, but this time I really mean it because this is my only podcast now. So, Rock and Metal Combat Podcast, my band, and YouTube was taking up a lot of time, my, my time. So now that I no longer do the main podcast, which was really hard to edit because I had to add music and stuff like that, that I never really had time to concentrate on Vieira Vault. Well, now I do. And now it's like just today, uh, you know, on a whim. I listened to Born Again. I was like, I want to do a podcast. And I'm sure there'll be many more podcasts coming in the very near future. I promise you, this will be... Uh, totally um, up to date, okay? No more fucking around. Vieira Vault is my podcast now. My one and only podcast. I will have guests. I will not have a co-host, but I will have guests in the future on here because I think it's better for me. I think, uh, I just, I think it's better for me, okay? I have nothing bad to say about the Rock and Metal Combat Podcast. I'm very proud of it. I'm glad we ended with a really great episode and uh, go out on top. And, uh, you know, I wish Ian the best, you know, whatever he does. And uh, that's it. So thanks everybody for watching. Love you all till next time, which will be very fucking soon. I promise you. Schmack him a gob. <laughs>